Thanks for listening to the Animal Control Report podcast. We are part of the Keep It Humane podcast network. Check us out, www.keepithumane.com forward slash podcast network. You'll find all the great content there, animal control related, animal shelter related, community cats, crime scenes, all the above, anything animal welfare related. We're covering it here on the Animal Control Report and the Keep It Humane podcast network. Help people, help animals. Hello there, and welcome to the Animal Control Report with your hosts. What the hell was that, Daniel? <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to be English, but I think I was Iron. Iron. That was more Iron. <laughs> or or Australian. <laughs> like I was waiting for you to say something about down under or something. Well, I don't know. We are coming live. Well, technically recorded live from England. Well, part of us are in England. Our guest is in England. And uh, it's me and Bishop. Hi, Bishop. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Wait, can you show off this shirt that you're wearing? That is incredible. For those uh... of you that, for those of you that uh, can watch on YouTube or even Spotify now, you should check out her shirt. Shut, shut your trap. Hey, is that shirt by any chance related to LiveTrap.com? Oh, where did I go? There we are. Tomahawk Live Trap. Tomahawk Live Trap. Well, it's funny that you say that, so we should probably visit our sponsor. Tomahawk Live Trap exceeds customers' expectations by providing them with the highest quality, humane, animal control traps available. Check out their new Gravity Series dog traps. They feature a door that basically just you open it and it sets. You don't have to click on the little plate or any of that type of stuff. So just open the door. It sets. All the animal has to do is go in there, click on the, the little trigger, and then boom, it closes. So use... Uh, Use Keep It Humane for 10% off your order at LiveTrap.com. Again, Keep It Humane, 10% off your order at LiveTrap. I didn't even know you were going to wear that shirt today, so that was a great segue. I I mean, I partially chose it, but I also, my kids have shooting sports later, and it's a very hunting-ish community, so it's also very fitting. Good. Very fitting. Well, so. check out our website, KeepItHumane.com. We have stuff going on. What's going on? Oh, it's March. This will air March. No, it's February 20th. This will air the 20th of February. It's hard for me. Gabapentin is no joke. Um, uh, trust me, I know. I had to get <laughs> off of it. <laughs> so uh, we're still collecting, and we've actually got a bunch. I, I will say, I, I put out a post probably once or once every week, once every two weeks, just asking for good stories, videos, photos of animal control officers doing their job. Because uh, Animal Control Officer Appreciation Week is coming up the second week of April. And we're just trying to get ahead of it. I'm going to put something together. We're going to have some fun with that. So uh, thank you for those have, that have participated. For those of you that want to continue to participate, you can email any of that stuff to Daniel at keepithumane.com, keepithumane.com. Uh, and then check out our, what is it, Facebook, Instagram. What else we got? It's a, uh, YouTube. You, oh, YouTube. Yeah. Just punch in the Animal Control Report on YouTube. You can see us, What you know making fun of each other and you want to make fun of me really quick always animal shenanigans so yeah and all the animals that come on (laughs) so there's a new cvs which is a pharmacy opening like maybe 500 yards not even 200 yards from the house and i needed to get an ace bandage because my knee you know i'm still wrapping it for compression and stuff and i'm driving home this is i'm telling you i'm so dazed and confused I'm driving home and I drive right past it and there's A-frame signs that are red and CVS is red right out front of the CVS market. And it says now open and I'm just like, sweet. So I get my dog and I start walking to the CVS and I get there and I look at the A-frame and it says now open for leasing for the apartment building above it. (laughs) (sighs) Horrible. Daniel, you got to take in all of the information before you can make a judgment and uh, yeah, I, decisions. There's a, there's a lot I need to do. A lot I need to do. So how's Bishop? <laughs> how are things? Uh, I mean, I'm equally still on the healing process, still on light duty. So have been since November from a work-related injury. So that's fun. Mm, okay. And you said you were going to the range later? Not for me, for my kids, but yeah. What they're doing sh- air, ri- air air rifle and archery. That's fun. Do they love it? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And they're actually getting pretty good at it considering they've touched each of those like three times and can at least consistently hit the target. So probably way better than I can do. So shout out. <laughs> shout out to them. That's awesome. Well, I think we should jump in. We have a cool guest from from England. Hello there. We are gonna I'll stop. That'll be the last stop time. it. I, I We're gonna it. lose listeners, Daniel. I might not stop, but I might. So Maya Batum, I think is how I say it. If if I say it with an English accent, it probably sounds way cooler. And you're with safeguarding animals or safeguarding animal and human survivors of sexual and domestic abuse. So we know in this profession as animal control officers, one of the one of the big things that we deal with is that link between animal abuse and domestic violence. And so we're super happy to have you on to kind of share your, you know, what you're doing there in across the pond, as they say, and just uh, get more information and, and how we can help animal control officers and others, other listeners be prepared in these situations. What, uh, what got you into this? <laughs> I just, someone asked me that yesterday as well. So it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's funny that, uh, it's the second day in a row someone's asked me that. So, so I've been in, um, kind of the domestic abuse sector or domestic violence sector for about 10 years. So I started out, um, so in my, my degrees, so I, have, I have two degrees and they're both related to kind of, gender inequality uh gender depression over time and um uh, and domestic abuse and sexual violence uh to human to human um and then when I left university in 2016 uh one of my first jobs was in advocacy so I was a qualified what's called a, a independent sexual violence advisor or ISVA um and my my job was to support survivors of domestic and sexual abuse through like one-to-one emotional support uh, through court processes you know if they had housing or benefit um, issues that were related so I'd kind of do this holistic wraparound support for that individual and whatever they needed um, and then and during that time I you know I did start to see the use of companion animals as a tactic of coercive, coercive control and behavior or domestic abuse um as well um but I wasn't really I didn't really get into the subject until I got my dog in 2019 um so and I left frontline work so I left frontline one-to-one support work and I moved into training and education so um I did um a kind of violence against women domestic abuse and sexual violence training to police social services family courts frontline domestic abuse services um on kind of make awareness raising topics relating to domestic abuse and then I got my dog in 2019 um and I just was fascinated by him <laughs> I found him the most interesting being you know I had a dog growing up but he was my first my dog kind of thing my completely my responsibility and I was just so interested in you know why is he doing like why is he doing that what's he thinking you know what does he need from me and all of this kind of thing um, and I found that the way that I worked with Pod, who's my dog, Podrick, um, mirrored quite a lot of the way that I would interact with human trauma survivors, even though he wasn't tra- traumatized in any way, but just that kind of empathetic, gentle approach, understanding space, time, patience, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then the more I got into dog behavior and well-being and welfare and, and uh, reading and researching, taking courses on on it, um, I realized that the people that I was interacting with in that sector, so behaviorists, trainers, vets, you know, they didn't really necessarily have a very good understanding of the, the safeguarding responsibilities that they had or the signs and the um, signs and uh, and the dynamics that they may, may come across in relating to that link between domestic abuse and, and animal abuse. Um, so um, SASTA is relatively new. Um, it's I launched the website in November 2023 and it really took off in January 2024 but I've been dabbling in talks and things for the last kind of three to four years um but I really needed something to consolidate that work that I was doing because I still work part-time in my my kind of main role um that's outside of the animal sphere I suppose um um yeah so so Sasta is a I don't do frontline 
support um with sasta but i do my, my main goal with it is to raise awareness of the link and you you get people to utilize that information more because i think the link is quite well known now like lots of people even if you asked you know the average joe um they they often know there's a there's a link between animal cruelty neglect and abusing humans but what i find there's a discrepancy between professionals working um understanding that information and then like using that information to further risk manage and safety plan around the human survivor and the animal or animals as well um so so that does that explain kind of how i got into it it's kind of like a slow progress <laughs> progression yeah but, uh... <laughs> i want I, I guess for our listeners too really quick just so they can have a website to check out and we can put it in the show notes it is uh s-a-h-s-d-a so yeah. s-a-h-s-d-a dot wix site dot com dot wix site dot com so check that out there's a lot of good information there i think and it's just uh, there's change now so it's just www.sasta.org oh. yeah oh, we don't need yeah. that wix site anymore no okay, no cool. no it's it's uh yeah so it's, it's really easy okay cool that makes it a lot easier that thank you with so that, yeah oh i was just gonna say you said that after you kind of left school is when this kind of thought came about and you realized more about the link so similar to the u.s are they not teaching much about it in the schools yet uh well my undergraduate degree was in history so it, it okay. didn't really um um come up too much in that that was, um and then my my master's is in human rights law um but really it's not even in the uk regularly talked about there are some courses where it's touched on so um the veterinary courses um so in the uk there's the uh, all vets they have one class i think on the link between animal abuse and domestic abuse but it's in their early years and you know um it takes so long to qualify as a vet <laughs> that yeah. and i know because because i i've trained um uh doctors uh first year do med medical students on domestic abuse and um by the time they qualify it's kind of like this is a silly it's kind of it should be it would be better to do it either at the end but what i'm trying to do with the courses that i'm writing is what i want them to be seen as is something that you have to do regularly so you repeat it at regular intervals the same as say your first aid your first aid courses which every kind of between every three to five years you need to redo it so you really are sharp um, um with your knowledge and skills i suppose i wanted to uh, i just wanted to Sorry, really quick you you uh you jumped in about well you didn't even it, it, it can't it flew naturally when you were talking about your dog and you referred to him as a being and i, mm. I wanted to just i forgot to tease our segment the supplemental report that'll be brought to us later in the show mm. from ray smith and it's a it's it's interesting because she is going to talk about that exact thing about terminology and you know, animals in this country are considered owners or owners property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so as we transition to that later today or later in the program, we'll get to that. But in, is it, is it commonly, are animals commonly referred to as beings in the UK or are they property just like they are here in the States? Um, they're still classified as property under the law in the, in the UK. Um, but I guess it's kind of a progressive um, caregiver. Um, my, my my language mirrors what I call a trauma-informed approach with humans. So because I take so much from human psychology, child development, and um, that kind of way of thinking and that language when working with animals and dogs specifically, um, I that's the language that I personally use. And um, I don't know if I should, um, and I can... Um, find a copy uh so that you you can link it somewhere um but i wrote in 20 i think it's 2022 now the the compliance to partnership planet for living with dogs um and it's not so much to do with um abuse but it's to do with as a society we still have a very kind of strict view of of dogs specifically in uh in terms of our expectations on them and um what we want from them and kind of that labeling of good bad behavior etc um so that's what i call the compliance planet because what's what lots of people do is they love their dog obviously they love their dog but they still have this compliance obedience control based way of living with them and what i'm trying to do is is 
move people onto a partnership based model. So the partnership plan, it talks about how companionship, collaboration, consent and compassion um, should be a bigger factor in living with dogs um, than getting them to obey everything we want in a kind of arbitrary way a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah, happy to share that with, if people are interested. Yeah, please do. And we'll link that yeah. in the show notes. I really quick. I've noticed in this country, I've done a, a little bit of work, probably not as much as you have on the link. And one thing that I noticed is there are six states in this country that require law enforcement officers to take training on how to recognize and understand dog behavior. So they're less likely to shoot them uh, in mm-hmm. situations that they don't need to to do that. Right. Which I would say mm-hmm. is like 99% of the time they don't need to. Uh there is zero legislation or any requirements in this country that require law enforcement officers to take training on recognizing animal abuse and domestic violence. And there was one bill, and I want to say it was Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken, it died on the hill. Everybody know that song? The bill died on the hill song? Anyway. Yes. Um, it, and so... The bill on Capitol Hill. That's the one. Mm-hmm. I was going <laughs> to sing another song. But you, I don't want me singing on this program. That's not why you're here. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it, it astounds me that it's it's not taught to our police officers in the police academy. I'm actually part of a a, uh, a group that uh, puts a training on every quarter for military police officers and or in investigators and some of their mil- so everybody on the military bases around the around the world. Right. They have their own little cities throughout the world. And so on those military bases, they're just like any city anywhere. And they have, you know, real problems. And one of the things that they noticed during some of their data collection was a a very high spike of domestic violence. And so they wanted to ensure that they were teaching those that are out there enforcing it how to recognize it. But it, it didn't stop there. And so some of the students that we get in class are also veterinarians on the military base or the family advocacy group. And so I spend three days uh, out there putting together all the different elements that could potentially be a a linked type of crime to animal abuse. And uh, it's been really well received, but we need more of that. Like we need that in our police academies while, while these folks are going through. So they're seeing it. I can tell you in the 10 years that I worked in Denver, it, I worked there and, and the majority of times that I ever got called for a police assist <clears throat> was because somebody was either going to the hospital, somebody was going to jail or somebody was dead and they needed an animal picked up. I can count on one hand how many times that they ever called because they were out on a situation that there was family violence and there was an animal that, that was potentially abused, neglected, etc. It only happened maybe three times that I could think of if if we sat here and try to go through it. And so we need more of that. Is that something that you're doing over over there too, is educating some of the law enforcement as well? Uh, yeah, it's in my plan <laughs> um, for sure. I think there's also a need for research um, into how police um, do or don't use the knowledge appropriately. Um, in the UK, we we... We have the RSPCA, so the Royal Society of Protection Protection Against Cruelty to Animals. Um, and I think one of the issues we have here is policing sometimes go, oh, um, okay, this is an animal cruelty thing, RSPCA. And, and so they don't see that actually it's both domestic abuse related and animal cruelty neglect related. Instead, we, we try and see it in silo, um, which I don't think is helpful. Um, and then my other thing is getting police officers to potentially use information relating to the animal as evidence evidence for domestic abuse or coercive controlling behavior um because over in the uk we have we have a separate piece of legislation um around coercive controlling behavior which is the kind of psychological element of domestic abuse so that kind of insidious pattern of behavior that most survivors um, are subjected to we often think about physical violence as being kind of the predominating factor, but really actually it's that pattern of uh, controlling behavior. So where they exercise control to the nth degree. So it's, you know, how much sleep can they have? Where do they sleep? Um, Can they eat? What do they eat? Where do they go? Who do they see? What do they wear? What do they read? All of that kind of really um, 
massive control of the life of that person and the children within that family. Um, and in terms of risk, the higher the control, the higher the risk. So we often mistakenly think about uh, violence severity. And like obviously that is a factor, but it, it's the control that we need to look at in much more detail because there have been cases where domestic homicide has happened and there's been no physical abuse at all, but there's been extreme coercive control um, elements. Um, and under the law in the UK now, under the Domestic Abuse Act 2021, um, animals were formally kind of formally seen and uh, acknowledged as being a tactic of abuse with relation to economic abuse. So it's a le uh, it, it's kind of listed in our legislation that if someone prevents a person from from um, uh, being able to buy food for an animal or taking that animal to the vet is economic abuse under the law. Um, I don't think it necessarily goes far enough. I think there's definitely room for improvement, but it, it was a hallmark kind of um, occasion that happened um, here in the UK around around that. Do you guys have any laws? And I know that this is a stretch. I don't believe there's anything here in the US um, for psychological abuse of animals. Not to my knowledge at all. And it's interesting because... The Domestic Abuse Act 2021, it was the first piece of formal legislation that recognised that children living in environments where there was domestic abuse are victims in their own right. So before we used to call them witnesses. So, you know, um, we you know, if they saw the, the non-abusive parent being harmed by the parent, the other parent, or they were living in an environment, because this is the other thing, like when someone abuses say the non-abusive parent normally the mother and they that person's not allowed to drive or that person's not allowed has to be home by a certain time that still impacts the child even though the child is not the direct target of that abuse because that child can't see their friends or go to birthday parties or you know um interact in society in the normal way in, in terms of their development because the the non-abusive parent is life is being so limited um and before they were kind of just yeah, renegated to witnesses but now under the act they're they're seen as victims in their own right even if they're not physically harmed and my point of view is um especially when we talk about dogs because that's that's my area of expertise in terms of dogs having the emotional capability and cognitive capacity of around a three to four five year old child i think that they should be seen as victims in their own right um alongside children but i um we do have a new there's a new law i can't remember exactly when it came in or came in or if it's coming in around animal sentience mm. so the government is formally recognizing that um certain animals have sentience in the uk and that's going to be really interesting to see how it does develop as we go forward with legislation and, and things around animal abuse and there was also oh, sorry neat because that'll tie into the supplemental report too a little later so oh sure you brought that up with with uh some of the studies that i've done i actually just it's ironic we should have had you on a week ago because <laughs> on tuesday i just did a, a class on zoom and i it's really been sitting with me for a long time like this idea or concept that the link is not just animal abuse and domestic violence right i i I don't know why we haven't put any focus on dog behavior and dog bites and domestic violence. And so I did a whole class on that and there's just not a lot of data out there. There's a little bit, but there's just not a lot of data out there to support it. And so you really have to sift through a lot of that. Uh, but I mean, if you look at it just from the plain view, common sense aspect, if an animal is threatened or harmed right it has three ways to, of, to, to communicate right so like verbal nonverbal, and physical and the more that you back an animal into a corner eventually it's going to bite but the other thing a lot of these animals our dogs have uh, instincts to protect and so if there is abuse going on in the home it is likely that that dog is going to try to protect and then unfortunately it is going to then be subject to physical abuse by that abuser as well however there's just not a lot of that information out there yet. And I'm wondering if, if you've ever looked into that over there uh, and, or if you're seeing any of that like data or it happening in the UK. 
I I haven't seen any research or and my my assumption is that there probably isn't much because it's just so under researched. I think the issue one of the issues we have with the link research is there's loads on kind of what the link is and how it looks like, but then we're not pushing it for that to that like next level, which is being really specific and then also looking at how it relates to um risk and then how we actually use that knowledge um practically um to to better create safety for the animal and the humans my, my like anecdotally um i think that that it makes sense that um that there's a correlation between dog bites and domestic abuse um i think there's many different ways you know that that and and an animal and a human reacts to tra to traumatizing situations, and we know that um, dogs, you know, they can also. Ex so in humans, we we talk about the five Fs. So we talk about fight, flight, freeze, flop, and friend in humans, um, and in in dogs, there's definitely fight, flight, freeze, um, and friend tends to be that more appeasing behavior. So that kind of ears back, licky licky, kind of um, low to the ground be my friend be my friend kind of thing and and it some for some and i think as well like um everyone's individual and it's the same for our animals so what might make some dogs bite at a different level to other dogs will be unique to their maybe their genetics their learning their environment as well so it, it's i think it would be it would make really interesting research um but I think it would be and I think it would be variable depending on lots of those external factors, because even though abusers, um, there's kind of like a map of kind of the, the most common tactics that abusers will use. Um, they all will abuse in a slightly different way because they're also individuals that have their own um, kind of unique eccentricities, I suppose, is how they choose to inflict their abuse on the person or the animal. You know, Daniel, I think that the biggest reason why we don't have a lot of that research is unfortunately, um, the FBI does monitor animal abuse um, and the link and things like that as far as when they're looking at reports and when the police are sending reports over. The biggest problem there is that if you are not a sworn officer, your reports don't go through NIBRS and the FBI doesn't get it. Um, and so how many police officers are actually doing the bite reports versus animal control officers doing the bite reports? FBI is not getting that. They're not, it's not getting sent through NIBRS. And then and, they can't cross-reference that to other right. abuse in the home. That's a solid point. And part of the reason I, I thought about this class in general was to give officers just a different view on when you're out there on a bike call. Like what else is going on in the home? Yep. And it goes back to my point of like where we've out of 10 years, 10,000 calls or whatever, I can I can remember three police assists that's like they that police officer was like, what else is going on in the home? Right. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to get that tunnel vision and just focus on it's a bite right mm -hmm. okay but where is the bite right like what were the circumstances of the bite because that also plays and impacts potentially the outcome of uh, of the animal, dangerous right? dog yeah all of that all of that so just really interesting stuff i want to work with you i don't know how we work together electron i mean it's easy with today's today's world but if there is a way that you want to work together on that bite stuff maya i would love to sure. to, to figure out a way to do that and i think that you know it did seem, Dan, like um, Ian Dunbar, they had recently put out, remember, we talked about this quite a while ago, and I honestly have not used it since, and I haven't really seen much about it since, um, but they started a online process for dog bites that you put in yeah, so all that, the circumstances. It was going to replace, it was going to replace the, the, the current one through six scale and are you my are you familiar with dr ian dunbar i think he's yeah I, yeah i'm familiar but, with him yeah i they i think like it became too messy in my opinion the the sheet is easiest but maybe what you're saying bishop is like a variation of that 
Yeah, like having something that you can go to a to be able to determine the the bite, but also being able to utilize that as a piece of research where okay, you're getting all this information in now, utilize it in some research. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. It's a great idea. It's definitely um something I'm interested in including in the the training that I'm writing for those who enter the home so i'm looking at writing some training for uh so policing social services kind of health visitors you know those people that are going in into homes that might um might be going in for one reason coming across something else and then are also at, may, potentially at risk of dog bites themselves so i think just generally mm -hmm. having boosting the awareness of you know those strangers coming into a house anyway on the risk around dog bites and then um linking that to domestic abuse and while well, other kind of interpersonal violence I think is really important um from a personal safety point of view for the the professionals also entering the the home you could even include people in there who perform services for people like they come in to fix their electricity or something mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I had a case with a guy who was there to fix a woman's internet was in there and made this whole report about how she physically abused this dog right in front of him and a lot of times you know you, you know you see with like hoarder cases and stuff if somebody's coming there to work on the water or whatever the case is like a lot of times they're gonna see that and be able to provide more info than police or ems who may not even get access to inside to see what the conditions are yeah that's actually a really good point I think the training does need to expand across like it needs to, you know, I mean, we say it here on the show all the time, though, we just started saying that like the beginning of the year, we have to help people help animals. Right. And so in that aspect of like, how do we, how do we get that message out there that doesn't feel like a cheesy infomercial? I mean, I hate to say it that way, but uh, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember, but I used to sit in school in the fifth grade and they'd wheel out this cart that had a big old TV on it and they plug in this big thing. It's called a VHS cassette and they would put it in there and you'd watch this Hallmark movie on how to be nice to people. Like granted the morals of it is gr are great, but we have to figure out a different way to really um, get into the community and, and educate, right? See something, say something like it's, it's not, there, there shouldn't be anything sacred when it comes to our families and and as far as like reporting reporting that back like you shouldn't be scared to report it and i know people are you have something to say boy come here come on come on come on What's hi mooney on? he's your dad sorry <laughs> Mooney's he's very he's very vocal it's it's dog time but my point is like the the reality is if there is abuse going on in the home and those situations are are not being reported because someone's scared of retaliation. Like there has to be some measures in place to keep people safe. And, and I'm not sure like, you know, how we do that since I'm not in law enforcement role, but there's gotta be places. Do you want to on the mic? <laughs> that was Mooney there. Thanks. <laughs> No, I think that this is great. I, I did take a look at your website and it you've got some training and it looks like you might do some training via Zoom. Is that correct? Yeah, so, so at the moment I'm in kind of the writing part. I'm currently writing a level two award in understanding uh, safeguarding for pet professionals for its um, iPet network. So um, we'll be hopefully releasing that at some point in um, in the next few months, six months um, or so. That, that one's more um, related to uh, pet professionals like groomers, um, dog walkers, um, pet sitters, you know, um, people that are not necessarily even well-versed in behaviour necessarily. Um um and then i'm hoping to do some other ones for different sectors so because really you do need to bespoke it depending on who the people are so um pol policing is going to be in there social services will be in there uh frontline uh domestic abuse services so what i used to do in terms of one-to-one -one support um and then 
yeah any any kind of specific roles that that need it um um I'll be in there will be there as well and yeah I I will mainly be digital based um uh yeah once I once I've kind of finished writing it all I suppose uh so does that mean it will be available to us here in the US as well for the digital based stuff yeah yeah so I I I prefer to do live training where possible just because it allows that um question so it'd probably be that I do each country as a live so I'll do like I know and I know it's it's difficult with America because you have so many times so, um <laughs> so it's like I can't just put one on for the whole of America because there's like all these times so it'll be kind of I'll have to uh work that out and it's the same with Australia I had a I had a um meeting with a vet in Australia and we'd done the time conversion but what I hadn't realized was that they're obviously we're actually on different days because the time is so is almost so I was ready at the day after she was ready the day before <laughs> so and I was and so I woke up in the morning to kind of this message saying oh we're not meeting today and I was like yeah we're meeting it's the second it's the second and she's like well it's the third here already because so it was that I think that's a completely separate um issue but yeah um definitely and I can do recorded things as well so definitely there'll be a um a suite of things available recorded live and I'm hoping to write some sort of like guidance and, and things as well that people can have available easily available for information um is my hope yeah that's awesome because I'm excited. I think you've got some really good information coming. I'm I'm excited to hear it because we definitely need to have more available out there because there's not a lot, like we've said. So. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, sure. And you're always welcome to come back. And if you have that information, you're doing something mm -hmm. new. Even if you can't make the show, just send us the info and we can plug I it. I will, yeah. We can plug it on the on either our socials or just bring it up on the show since we try to stay pretty current week to week. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks for sharing that stuff. You're more than welcome to stick around for our supplemental report. Supplemental report is brought to you by the Humane Educators of Texas since they named the damn thing. It's the Humane <laughs> Educators of the Humane Educators of Texas dot com. Don't let Bishop fool you again. Humane Educators of Texas dot com. And we're gonna just jump in. Uh, to Ray, Ray Smith is going to bring us a supplemental report about pugs. If you're watching on YouTube, <laughs> it's pugs. It's all about pugs. She's got to be on. She has to be here. I love it. Um, Yeah, so I, I love this topic. It's one of the things I'm most passionate about because I don't think that we talk about it enough. And it has a really significant impact um, on our field in general. So... Um, I want to separate this out into two different areas. One, how we refer to animals from property to sentient beings, and then how we refer to humans from ownership or, or owners to guardians. And I think, um, you know, jumping into how we refer to animals. Um, so, you know, we... There's about 30 to 35 countries out there that actually has uh, refers to animals in their federal um, constitution as sentient beings. And the U.S., and now we just found out that the U.K. is not actually one of them. Um, and it's significant because when we start referring to animals as property, it demeans what their value is in to the public to um to society in general and so this idea of referring to animals instead of as property to sentient beings is a, this this movement of hopefully trying to um change like the society the way that society perceives them um in and in a psychological perspective and then and then again in like in a lawful perspective is that if everybody can get on board with referring to them as sentient beings and giving a different kind of connotation to their existence other than property then we stand a better chance of looking at their welfare and advocating for stronger protections for them um because of that so um you know they're you know 
it's ridiculous to refer to a dog or a cat or an elephant or whatever kind of animal as as property like they're not a shoe they're not an inanimate object um the sentience is essentially just means that they have the ability to perceive or or, or feel things and it's not specific to pain or complex emotions it's just feel is what sentience is and so Ray, I, I gotta jump in on this i have a question because i know our listeners are if i'm thinking of it i know our listeners are thinking it bishop you probably know where i'm going with this as someone who currently me uh only eats plants where does the line get drawn right because uh, i think if people start hearing that they're gonna start to assume oh, that yeah. they're starting they're gonna start Probably. to he's he's excited when he's this is a topic he's like i'm sentient y'all need to chill but no in all seriousness <laughs> like will is there a does it stop at our pets that live in the home or is this all animals and then how does that affect our food producing animals i guess is what people are thinking at least i know i'm thinking that so sen like sentience, in my opinion, applies to all animals. And I say that because if you acknowledge that they can feel, uh, that's a basic instinct for being able to survive, whether it's, you know, a starfish or a dog or whatever it is. And plants don't, plants don't feel things. Inanimate objects don't feel things. The ability to be able to perceive feelings is ingrained um in every living being because without that there would be no drive to survive to you know procreate to to try to just live and so um that that to me is the difference and the way you know when you mention like agricultural animals um it's 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 different because all of the um you know companies who raise you know animals for for consumption tend to refer to animals as products they take any kind of emotional um uh coupling with that and separate it they don't look at them as animals who could feel and there i mean there's studies that, uh, in in every aspect of this right of how um birds are extremely um emotional they they need to live in flocks you know for anybody who's who's an animal welfare sees like a, an african get gray by themselves and they don't get attention they go crazy um for people who study um aquatic animals they've been able to prove that you know starfish for example who most people wouldn't think that they you know that they they can perceive things they run studies on them where they have pleasure centers within them with it they they can actually stimulate so it's so it's so um it's it's such a vast area and it, it's it it it's important to be able to refer to them in as sentient beings for the purpose of um changing opinions from the public i mean i one thing that's really difficult um i think for a lot of apos that can that can relate to this is that you know you get a call about an abused animal and they they say we want you to remove we want you to remove them that they don't take care of them they don't care about them and you have to have that hard conversation of well their property and it's like so cringy to hear that and have to say that to people because here that's that's what they are um and you you don't have the ability to just go in and just remove whatever animal from a condition unless you have probable cause to do so so um if there was a different kind of understanding uh you know in 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 general acceptance of how they're referred to i think that it could have a significant change in how people perceive them and how we can further ordinances and, and laws in general to advocate for better protections for them. Are there any current bills or laws or anywhere in this country that does classify? I know somewhere in Oregon looked at it at one point. I don't know if it ever passed. Um, well, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to mess this name up. 
uh, or what the there's a city in California last year. It's like oh, Ojai uh, that ended up um, classifying animals as, as sentient beings because of the the elephants in the circuses that they had there. And you know, I worked for a, uh, the city of Boulder, you know, years ago, where in our ordinances, you know, they animals were referred exactly to that as sentient beings and it's it's changing there was an, a new law that was passed in british columbia that changed the how animals are referred to in divorce proceedings um so there i mean there there's several changes coming about it's just slow progress I think, Dan, to kind of go back and answer your question about the um, quote unquote production animals and the farming, I think as somebody who is not a vegetarian, um, I'm not a vegetarian it'll, either. You and your plant based, no, we had this discussion. Use I'm the not, words. I'm not a vegetarian, though. Because I don't. Are you eat vegan? Well, yeah, technically, I don't do oh. milk, but no milk. Oh, I never know the difference, so that's my bad. But my well, point you gotta put being, a label on me, bro. My point being is, I think even you know, there's gonna be some extremists out there, no matter what, right? One way or the other, you're gonna have some extremists. But I think oh. this is would open up the opportunity for better and more humane treatment of all of the animals if they are seen as sentient they I, will I agree. have to I agree. like so i don't see it as a bad thing even for the production industry but you know there are people that would say like we don't we're not going to want to call our eight thousand chickens i can't say that word sentient or sentient i think you can do it either way so it's like potato potato I think so. Sentient. Which one do you prefer? Sentient. I like it. Well, no, and, and you're absolutely right as we get back on track. I think the the idea or concept of like just thinking this is product, it's inventory is, I think, um, a little bit prehistoric in some aspects. Well, it's changing too. Um, like, didn't, uh, didn't California ended up passing a bill where they're not going to import any any um pork that originates from gestation crates um so there's a big like there's a as time goes on the public is becoming more aware of the conditions that these animals live in and i think that um that the name like what you end up referring them to as has a significant psychological impact on people in general to um, be more um, caring or humane towards them. It, you know, calling a calling a chicken a product has has in, invokes different feelings than referring to them as it's a, a dinosaur. Thing. It's okay. <laughs> oh, we did cover that last week, <laughs> two weeks ago. Oh, I don't, time doesn't exist anyway. Ray, this is, I mean, in all in all seriousness, though, and, and I think this topic is extremely important and valuable to what we're continuing to try to do here on the program, but also I think as just the humane movement across uh, the world, uh, I say that loosely. I, I know some places are stronger than others. And, and so I definitely, um, I support it. I mean, as you saw, my dog Mooney was going crazy today because he's just like, he probably knows I'm traveling. And so he's like, let's play before you go, dad. You know, because he, <laughs> He has feelings too. Let's see if we can get him on camera really quick. No dog. I, has he been on camera enough today? Am I am I being one of those dads? Oh, you are definitely one of those dads. Yeah, whatever. Love him. <sighs> okay. Well, Ray, was there any more on that that before we kind of before we wrap up? Well, it was the other half of how how people are referred to as owners instead of guardians as okay. well because i think that's just as significant um you know most places most jurisdictions refer to to humans as an owner um but again there's a different emotional 
um, connotation behind it when you change that to a guardian, you know, you, if you, you know, we don't refer to children as, or we don't, we don't refer to parents as, as owning their mm. kids. You know, you, you sign any kind of permission slip form or you go to the doctor or something for, for your child. And it's a, and it, they want a parent or guardian signature. Right. So, so Bishop, uh, I know that struck a chord. You got, I, I could see it in your body language. <laughs> I need to know what's going on, Bishop. I, I do foresee a lot of people having issues with that. And I don't know how I feel about it, but the issue is going to come up with taxes. Because I always, people are, I always say that I always like with pets when, cause you know, we, it's 2020, what year is this? 2024. And a lot of like the, whatever generation that is that, you know, don't really have children anymore. They refer to their pets as kids. And I always joke loosely that well until you can claim them as a dependent on your taxes they're not kids right but now if we're now guardians is that where i'll go adopt 600 freaking pets right now if i get a tax break that's the problem that are we going to see more it like if people start fighting for the taxes and people um actually get taxes back and tax breaks on them well now are we going to have borders i think there'd have to be a limit on that like you can only claim one pet as a yeah, dependent right i don't know but the, and again i don't really know where i fall on the line of and how i feel about that because pets are expensive but pets are also mm, i know i'm gonna get a lot of flack for this one pets aren't necessary Yes, they are great for our mental health, but in an age where we don't have availability for low-cost veterinary care and the ability to for everybody to be able to take care of them, some people shouldn't have them in those cases um, until we can get that industry stabilized a little bit better. Does that make sense? It I does. think you can make that same argument for people, though, because having children isn't necessary. And there are a lot of people nope. who can't take their kids to the doctor and who don't. Well, people should probably be, it. people should probably I mean, be that, licensed that, to have kids, too, though. Yeah, <laughs> that's a different thing. Well, I think the IRS is going to have some say with the whole, with your point and in, in, in your respect to, to guardianship. But my point behind it is that. Again, it's a change in the public and our lawmakers' opinion of taking someone as an owner and referring to them as a guardian and what that looks like. Because, again, we did this, and that is exactly how people were referred to in the last jurisdiction that I worked for to help change the mindset of people that you are responsible for the care of this sentient being um how you know, did you see like did you actually see a difference in your last jurisdiction there but was boulder is boulder though i mean it's well i don't yeah, know what that so, means so boulder boulder was more hippy dippy is that's okay. the kind of a nice way of saying it <laughs> it is but it i mean for me when i saw things there people were more passionate about um what what any kind of potential lawful outcome was for those animals because of the language that was used which again is okay. another argument for referring to people as that to to push that legislation so it's not perfect and maybe there's a different word that we can come up with but um you know ownership it, you know in my opinion is a little cringy because again i think it devalues the whole meaning behind you know having an animal in your home or animals not even just in your home but um like we're not going to have people like tyson referring to their chickens in their huts as as guardians right but so maybe it's it doesn't work in every um in every uh industry but it's more it would be i think it would be more accepted with domestics initially because in general as time goes on a, 
a greater majority of people refer to their companion animals as their family. Um, so it's just my opinion. Yeah. And again, I don't necessarily disagree. I just wanted to play devil's advocate for what I can see some coming down the pipeline of some people's feelings on it. So Maya, Daniel, your... are we boring you? No, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm sleepy because I don't sleep. Uh, Maya, what's your take on, on that? Um, so I think it's interesting. I, I think, I don't think it's going to be a fast change. It's it's a conversation that's been happening over here for ages and ages. And I think there are lots of, there are lots of, uh, you know, intertwining issues around language anyway. Um, and in terms of the use of animals as a tactic of coercive control and domestic abuse, the property, um, them as property is an issue because it's it's a barrier it creates an additional barrier for people to leave um the perpetrator often will use um their kind of ownership of the animal as as uh as a way of maintaining power and control so through small claims court etc um but then i think if we took away the property label and we kind of saw them sim in a similar way to children you're going to have the same issues in like contact potentially the yeah, use of the family court yeah uh, uh the weaponization of that by perpetrators as well so i think um, um that's coming from like a domestic abuse point of view um from like a personal point of view i um i recognize that under the law i own my animals but i don't use that language um in the uk we use the term caregiver is um uh -huh, coming sure. quite a lot more being used um I hear caregiver more than I hear guardian. Um, but that's in the circles that I run in, which are very, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> uh, progressive when it comes to how we view our animals. I'll be uh, honest, though. My dog, like, he is my caregiver. In some <laughs> and I, I say you that need jokingly. One. I definitely need some, one. Sometimes I think, you know, la labels can be quite reductionist no matter how you look at look at it because i've not yet found a label that really truly explains the relationship that i have with my animals like i even say they're my animals i don't even really believe that they're mine you know so, so it's uh, right. we're limited by the language that we have anyway um so um i think it's a really interesting well we do it we do it even with our partners right that's my wife or my husband yeah, or my yeah, it's like yeah, well yeah. but why are we so possessive bro yeah like, you know, yeah this be like the person that I'm with. I just want folks to, uh, again, have an opportunity to check out your website again. That's sahsda.org. We'll put the link yeah. in the show notes, sahsda.org. How do you say that quickly? Sasta is how Sasta. I say it. Yeah. That's how you say it, Sasta. <laughs> we want to thank Ray for being our supplemental reporter today. Awesome stuff as always. Bishop, what do you got for us in closing? Check out all of our social medias facebook instagram youtube i'm gonna give away oh. one challenge coin to the person that texts finds my phone number somewhere on the internet and texts me that they listen this far in the show and you will get one of the challenge coins that you can find on our website keepinghumane.com again they're pretty sweet uh, also check out our podcast network folks that is the keepinghumane.com forward slash podcast network and look out for next week where the show is going to be hosted by Ray and Ashley because I'll be on an airplane. So they just found out about that right now. Thank you for listening. And as always, <laughs> let's help people. People help animals. And keep it humane. <laughs> humane. <laughs>